let's say you're a caveman, a uh, cavewoman. You get back from picking berries, and there's your tribe. But something's not right about their faces, like they're keeping something from you. Now, your ability to read this situation, it's a matter of survival, because maybe they ate the woolly mammoth without you. OK, so uh, what I'm talking about here is social intelligence. And it ranges from the ability to read body language, to detecting a liar, to uh, empathy, altruism. And um, what sociologists think is that this is a better predictor of your success than grades or test scores. So what I want to do to begin is to quiz you on your ability to read facial expressions. So to help us is Cato Kalin from the O.J. Simpson trial. <laughs> and if you can go ahead and yell the answer if you know it. Fear, confusion, or disgust. What do you see in his face? Disgust. Disgust. <laughs> University across cultures, this is disgust or, or contempt. Uh, this just leaked out of his face during the O.J. Simpson trial. They had to slow down the tape to get it. But we all do this. We all have these momentary um, leakages of micro expressions from our face. And you can get better at learning how to read these and your friends. Um, I recommend a book called Emotions Revealed by Paul Ekman. Um, seriously, you should try it. Your friends will wonder why you're being so attentive. But um, <laughs> the amazing thing is that our brain sends this impulsive emotional signal to contort the face before the rational mind can override it. And another way to put this is that our emotional brain fires first. And this makes sense because our emotional brain evolved first. And all the rational stuff, it's all just intertwined and completely inseparable from the emotional stuff. So here's an example of that. You've done this before. <laughs> if you were to memorize a list of objects in a very short amount of time, you may have some trouble with this. And yet, I bet even as I'm speaking, some of the audience are already forming this, these objects into a story. Can anybody, do you see it? Yes. So we are hardwired to look for the narrative. And you could list off many more objects in the story, Cinderella, if I asked you to. Um, when they asked five-year-olds to memorize pairs of objects, like rat and pumpkin, they, five-year-olds were much more likely to, uh, 10 times better at it, in fact, uh, if it was put into a question like, why did the rat eat the pumpkin? That's because it was the beginning of a story. Now, if we evolve to look for the story, why does the story make it easier? I think the answer is empathy. We empathize with the characters in the story. And as a result, our brain actually secretes hormones when emotions are present that help make facts and memories stick. So how does this fit in with survival of the fittest? What we know about this. <clears throat> Well, when the arrival of the apes, social groups became much more complex, this became very key to survival. And our brains ballooned in size as we had to process all of these uh, complex social systems. And the bonobo is a creature that can probably tell us the most about our genetic disposition toward empathy. The bonobo is the hippie of the ape world, much more free love, <laughs> nonviolent than its chimpanzee counterparts. Um, this is a great story. A bonobo saw an injured bird in its enclosure, and it uh, picked up the bird, it, this is in the zoo, picked up the bird, unfolded its wings, and tried to launch it into flight like a paper airplane. <laughs> so this is Kanzi. This is the most famous of the bonobos. Um, Kanzi has mastered complex language by pointing to graphic symbols. And what's even more amazing, amazing is what he does with the symbols. He's a peacemaker. He tells the researchers when the other bonobos are excitable, tries to appease the situation. He also has great humor. He tries to pretend to eat the Georgia peach off the license plate. Really cute. And, <laughs> my cord. Um, he has great imagination and a great ability to put himself in others' shoes. So here's a thought. Empathy requires imagination. Imagination to say, what if I were a bird and I was hurt? And I think what may separate us from them is our ability to um, extend our imagination through, <laughs> hi, through space and time, <laughs> uh, beyond what's just in front of us. And if I want to leave you with one thought, it's this, that we are intelligent because we are social. Nature tells us this. And I think the problems of the future will be shouldered in large part by social ingenuity. And it's sort of up to us to pull our collective imagination to tackle those problems. So thanks for listening.